Welcome to Cooper Union. I am uh, Kevin Bowen, the director of the Cooper Union Institute for Sustainable Design, one of the sponsors of this evening's event. Um, I'm here to welcome you and say just a couple of quick things about, uh, I think, uh, an important discussion here. Um, you know, art is no doubt informed by science. And science, at least occasionally, is no doubt informed by what artists do. Um, this common ground is very interesting. Uh, we rely on each other. Uh, this institution is dedicated to the union of science and art. Peter Cooper felt very strongly that one discipline is weaker without the other. That together, the cultural enterprise of science and art is stronger. Um, art, no doubt, helps communicate complex ideas that sometimes scientists have a hard time getting across to the layman. Um, and I think science is, no doubt, occasionally inspired to seek other explorations based on artistic speculation. So it is a pairing that makes a lot of sense. And this panel discussion, in addition to talking about the very scientific nature of the methane question, is also going to look at that question of the interface of science and art. Um, it's interesting that this event is supported by the Rauschenberg Foundation, part of Marfa Dialogues. It's interesting that the Rauschenberg Foundation, uh, one of our major artist-based foundations, by arguably one of the most important artists of our time, is now devoting its energy to questions of environment. Uh, this is a sign of our times, uh, that this is not their only focus. They are certainly, they are focusing their work in the art community, but they're focusing their work in this particular program, the Marfa Dialogues in the art community, in as much as it has to do with discussions about uh, environment. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Al Appleton. Um, Al is the former commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, arguably uh, one of the more interesting water commissioners of our modern era. Uh, he is an um, internationally known uh, environmental consultant, and he is a senior fellow to the Institute for Sustainable Design. Uh, and a professor here at Cooper Union and a good friend, we welcome you, Al. Thank you, Kevin. Um The panel tonight is an, inter is an interesting result of the application of artistic sensibility um, and a series of artists who have been in the forefront of the anti-fracking fight ever since they first perceived what it meant for their work and their environment in 2007-2008. Um, they dragged me in appealing to my interest in preserving one of my handiworks, the New York City watershed, um, and I've been involved ever since. I think the fracking fight is uh, a critical part of our time, and we're going to talk tonight about a very nuanced, a nuanced piece, uh, which is what makes the artistic participation so important. We are involved with a lot of nuance here, um, which is the natural gas. Now, um, to just provide kind of two minutes of global political context, um, the Global warming is clearly the central issue of the question of sustainability in our times. And there are people who argue that are in, in our indifference to global warming or our refusal to face its consequences, we may be committing, you know, spe you know uh, essentially racial suicide. Um, National Geographic two months ago ran a piece about if all the ice in the earth melts, and trended forward by 2200, we could get to that point, the oceans would rise 226 feet, um, which means that we here would be about 200 feet underwater. Um, the oceans are actually undergoing ecological change of a kind not seen in 300 million years. Um, they're acidifying. Um, there are interesting articles about jellyfish jamming up power intakes and changing fisheries. Um, the acidification of oceans is going to play havoc with essentially shellfish and with creatures that rely on backbones. Um, and it was backbone fish out of which we evolved. So um, 
We talk a lot about climate change. There's a lot this week of time being spent on Sandy. Um, the global warming doubters kind of try and claim that this is, you know, just um, weather variation. Actually, the truth of the matter is if we were on the, the pre-global warming weather pattern, the Earth would still be cooling. Uh, if we'd actually been in a warming trend, uh, we'd have been in real trouble. But we were, you know, global warming ran into the little ice age, um, which began about 1250, and, you know, um, I thank heaven for that. Nevertheless, um, Global warming is here, it's real. Hundreds and millions of concerned people are really worried about it. And they really don't know what to do about it because most efforts like Kyoto, like international agreements have kind of foundered. So that when natural gas came along and the fracking boom came along, there were many people who kind of did some very simplistic numbers and said, hey, providing a BTU of power burning natural gas only creates half the CO2 that um, burning coal or oil does, uh, this could be a great way to make some progress on natural gas. Um, the, this is an understandable phenomenon, frankly, having dealt with the political system for a long time, the political system is clearly desperate, and many environmental groups who have spent years working on this issue are equally desperate to be able to say we're making some progress somewhere. So when they look at a number that says that the United States um, CO2 emissions are down uh, to the lowest level since 1994. They're inclined to trumpet that. They're inclined to say that's a good thing. They're inclined to say it's great that natural gas is doing that. Even though we know that most natural gas today is going to be the result of gas fracking. And the environmental and landscape consequences of gas fracking um, are being bitterly fought over so that for the shale gas fracking industry, the suggestion that natural gas is the magic bullet to help us on global warming is a very important suggestion to them. It's kind of their legitimacy. It's kind of what makes the damage they inflict on landscapes, the kind of damage they inflict on green energy, politically legitimate. Um, unfortunately, um, there's more to the story than this. Global warming is not about controlling CO2, it's about controlling carbon. And there are other forms of carbon involved with CO2, of which fugitive methane, as some of our speakers this evening are gonna explain, these have very high leverage impacts on global warming. Um, so that fugitive methane has become kind of like the equivalent of deer ticks at a picnic. Um, it uh, brings, um, brings lots of nasty things in their wake. So the question really is whether or not the fugitive methane, and fugitive methane comes at three points in the process. When you extract it, it can come out of the wells. When you transmit it, it can come out of the pipelines and compressor stations. And when you distribute it, it can come out of leaky pipelines. The question is, is enough methane escaping during that process so that the so-called advantage of burning um, natural gas is offset by that fugitive methane. Um, to paraphrase Winston Churchill when he was first broadcasting about the German invasion of France, the news tonight from France is very bad. The news tonight on fugitive methane is very bad and um, our artists and scientists have an important job to do in conveying that and that's what this panel is about tonight. Um, Members of the panel who I'd like to introduce now so we can maintain our continuity. First of all, Barbara Arendahl. Barbara is an, um, one of the founders of Damascus Citizens for Sustainability. Um, she has wonderful degrees in bioengineering. She's a glass artist. Um, she's been involved in the uh, rural uh, Pennsylvania landscape for many years and has been a stalwart. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure to work with her and the community uh, groups she has organized. Um, it's one, it was one of her neighbors, Joe Levine, who's a partner of Kevin Bone, that explains kind of the family tree of uh, some of my involvement here. Um, Barbara is, has a great concept. She talks about how artists are self-tasking people. And one of the things that these artists have done is they've taxed themselves to get some answers to a question which people have not wanted to answer which is, what's the story on fugitive methane here? 
and is this really a good idea or is it really not? Um, Bryce Payne, who will speak after Barbara, is PhD and Director of Gas, I believe, Director of Gas Safety, if I have that right, Bryce. Uh, I'm sorry? What's your role with gas safety? Uh, Partner, Partner in Gas Safety, which is a company that does the kind of surveys and information gathering we want to have. Um, it's much of the work of Bryce that you're going to see up on the wall tonight. He's providing the science, you know, this kind of, you know, galvanizing some of these artists. And his findings are very critical to the methane debate. And so one of the things we're here with us in the audience is Bob Ackley, who I've been reminded not to forget mention because he's actually one of the craftsmen who does actually the real work in collecting this data. So um, then we have two artists who are going to follow up. Ruth Hardinger uh, uses installation sculpture works on with paper painting and photography to express relationship and processes. The BA Hunter, she's an organized art and activism against the drill at Exit Art. Her work has been exhibited recently all over the place, including uh, <laughs> the Lester Howler Gallery. She was the organizer of the art exhibit that's out here in the corridors about um, this problem. Um, she's been a terrific activist. She's been very involved, too, in another one of the unwelcome uh, deer tick issues that surround gas fracking, which is the radon levels um, that the use of gas fracking is going to expose people to. Um, the, she's involved with the uh, New York uh, Fine Arts Fiscal Sponsorship Program, Museum of Modern Art, um, Artist Book Collection, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Edward Albee Foundation, are among the public and private collections that hold her art. Rebecca Smith is an artist who works primarily in sculpture and drawings. She's been exhibiting widely since 1977. Her work combines color and form together, her tape drawing installations. These are images and maps and things. And she has been inspired by the methane emission study that she's helped drive to continue to work. Her sculpture can be found in many public and private collections, including the Brooklyn Museum, the Hyde Museum, Glen Falls, New York, the Picker Art Museum, Colgate University, Microsoft Collection, where my daughter works, I might add. Um, and the Terry Warren Museum of Art in Australia, which was where I've also worked, I might add. So Rebecca Smith, Tape and Steel, was on view at the Studio School Art Gallery in 2010-11, has been the recipient of Arts and Letters Award at the National Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, she has a few exhibits you might want to check out in 2014, including at the Flesher Ullman Gallery in Philadelphia and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. Um, okay, with, uh, so you're going to get some meaty people tonight and they're, they're wrestling with a meaty and complex and nuanced issue that if we're ever going to get the global warming right and the fracking debate right, has to be understood. Um, so we're taping the program tonight. The way we're going to do it, there'll be presentations from the four panelists, Then the panelists are going to take 10 minutes and talk among ourselves, and then we're going to take 15 or 20 minutes worth of questions. Um, the, and I will monitor the questions. Um, the, so let's begin with our ever stalwart Barbara Arendale. Greetings, and thank you for coming to this event tonight. The natural gas industry would like to foster an image that gas is a clean fuel and a non-fossil fuel. Neither is true. Yes, it does burn with a nice blue flame at the end user's stove, but it is a fossil fuel. And where gas is mined using slick water, hydraulic fracturing, the land, air, groundwater, and often aquifer water are contaminated with global air impacts, which are profound. When you add up all the emissions from production, processing, transport, and end user releases by generating real data instead of using assumptions based on estimates, the gas has a larger global climate impact than fuel oil or coal. This is in addition to the other environmental and long-term resource damage done by the gas-related activities. Here's a quick glimpse at the basis of our concern on the way to Manhattan. Unbeknownst to most people, the landscape of this country, above and below ground, has already been profoundly impacted by drilling for oil and gas. 
Bear in mind that currently, eight years since many of the exemptions were installed for oil and gas drilling in the 2005 Energy Policy Act, about 90% of wells drilled use hydraulic fracturing. The climate impacts of these activities are profound. These slides I'm going to show you are from the Pinedale Anticline in Wyoming. The area shown here is about three quarters of a mile across one well pad. This area is about two miles across, with about a dozen well pads. Okay. This is about seven miles across. This is also in Wyoming, the Jonah gas field. In 1986, this area shown is seven miles across. This is the same area in 1999. And this is the same area in 2006. And this is that same area from a small plane, an oblique view. This is the Allegheny Forest in 2009. Shows about 25 to 40 acre spacing between the well pads. Each well pad is three to five acres. Some are closer than that. Shown here are just some of the many processes involved in drilling. All produce waste and emissions and have impacts. This does not show the pipelines, compressors, or distribution systems. Of concern is what is introduced and what is released with impacts on health and climate. These are gas and fluid movement pathways. The figure on the right is from New York City's Hazen and Sawyer report. Shows how connections can be made from formation layers to aquifers, tunnels, and surface. These are the geological emission pathways that add to the surface, all that's happening on the surface, including distribution and end user pathways. These are all ways for methane to be released into the atmosphere. This is the DCS gas safety post-drilling view of methane emissions in the Susquehanna River Basin in the Wyalusing area, certified as impacted by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. The, this impact has been going on for three years now. The dotted circles are DEP designated impact areas. These emissions are about double baseline levels, enough to have a severe global impact. In order to explain how we have arrived here on the edge of climate science, peering over the edge at global extreme climate change, but with knowledge of what is happening and the hope of averting the final plunge, I want to look at the perspective of the members of the core group comprising DCS. This marvelous material we are wading into tonight, looking at what the actual fugitive methane emission situation is in Manhattan and what it means is not a surprise, but is proof of symptomatic global problems we, DCS, predicted. So how could a small group of non-academics, not official researchers, not a big green organization, how could we have been out in front of just about everyone starting the serious wake up about gas drilling and then collecting real data to back it up. So how did a small group of people essentially start what has become a movement to shift both consciousness and practice related to energy use? A major factor, all of the founders of DCS were, are, artists with many different specialties, architecture, graphic arts, music, sculpture, pottery, and even glass art. Artists are self-starters. They self-assign tasks. They see holistically and are not limited by boundaries of accepted thought and dogma. They enjoy thinking outside of the box. I have to start with who I am. I am trained in science and worked as an artist for close to three decades, using a lot of science in my work in glass. I worked in the field of custom stained and leaded glass design and fabrication. I built quite literally hundreds of panels, each one different in many styles. My work is in restaurants, new and existing home construction, churches, and many other places. My life and my work, my inspiration, is the incredible wonders of our magnificent earth. 
My inspiration has been the possibility of tr the translation of energy into form and color and light and image with joy in the process and the possibilities evoked by this translation of energy. It is, after all, that translation of personal energy into action that is the artistic process. What does artistic inspiration, artistic process have to do with fighting gastrolink or climate change? or understanding and communicating the connections between them or what to do about this. The form someone's art takes is very personal. The most basic art form is how you live your life. When I became aware of land leased around me for gas drilling and looked into the processes, the exemptions the industry holds, the externalization of costs for damages, I could see where it would go and it was not where I wanted to go. I have always greatly enjoyed collaborative work, co-creating, you could say. So other artists joined with me, each with unique talents, adding their energy to the effort, and what a huge co-creative artwork it has become. As all art begins with thought, idea, and then from that comes actualization, DCS has encouraged others to learn real facts, to speak out, and now there are many groups and many voices wanting a different path. I see myself as a science-based realist and visionary. I don't think of all this as political, as that seems too bendable, unreal, well, political. And we don't deal with governance as such, though the results do have regulatory and governmental impacts through greater public awareness. We have used what geopolitical tools have been available, but we are certainly not politicians. Personally, I am and have been quite emotional about my understanding of the impacts of drilling and fossil fuel use and the impetus to do this work. This is not a politician's perspective, it is an artist's perspective, fueled by an understanding of the science. Now the gas and oil industry on the other hand seeks to use ignorance as a specific strategy. So our observation of the failure of government and academia to gather actual data to monitor methane emissions made us want to get that actual data. The proponents of gas usage use government, for example, EPA estimates of methane and other greenhouse gases that are very flawed and based on other old estimates, not on actual measured data. Because the industry has exemptions to major portions of protective laws, like the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Superfund laws, the Community Right to Know laws, and others, they are released from liability for the damages they knew they would cause. As a person who grows food, notices what's happening in the natural world around me, and cares deeply for this earth, its creatures, and its future, I and the members of my group have been deeply energized to protect our home, this is the grassroots perspective to speak from your home. That we define our home as the globe does not mean we don't start with our little town. This is why our group has the name of a little town. The anti-fracking movement is in many ways doing the work that the larger institutions of a caring, precautionary society should be doing. In that void, by integrating art and science and collecting real data, DCS in particular has moved the concerns about energy usage and impacts to center stage. Indulging in what has become a never-ending search for how things work and who measures what, I learned about Gas Safety Inc., Bob Ackley, Dr. Bryce Payne, and the CRDS cavity ring down spectro spectrometry, you say that, machine <laughs> that can very pre precisely measure methane via a mobile setup in a car that you can send out to take measurements. After doing a baseline, the first ever area methane baseline ever done, and then also doing a series of post-drilling explorations, all funded by a mix of individuals, private foundations, and grants we applied for, we were ready to see if we could collect real data on what was happening in a large city looking at the distribution system and end user contribution to the total methane emissions picture. Now in the lobby out in front, there's a quote from Abraham Lincoln on a plaque out there written in stone. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to do our duty as we understand it. So now we're ready to go on to Manhattan. Thank you.
Just out of curiosity, if I'm going to give a show of hands, how many people in here would consider themselves scientists or have a background in science? Oh, we've got a few. How many of you consider yourselves artists and, and consider yourselves not to know the first thing about science? <laughs> well, then, we got only a few that answered the last part. Most of you were in the middle. I'm going to try not to bore you to death. I'm a scientist. I, I tend to do that. So let's go ahead and get started here. Since we're talking about science and art, one of the things that I, I, I want to try to get people to understand is science is actually pretty old. Um, and, it, and it really is defined as nothing more than the systematic pursuit of knowledge about the natural world. I got two quotes that I particularly like. One is from Hippocrates, who you probably all recognize that name. There are, there are in fact, two things, science and opinion. The former begets knowledge, the later ignorance. And then Albert Einstein said, and, and I, I wanted a nice summary from, say, what is science? Or what is it for? And the aim of science is to discover and understand the laws of nature. Now, I have come over my own years as a scientist to conclude that science, when well done, is actually an art. And I say that in the sense that it is largely a creative act. And when you're, anytime you're looking at a, at a mass of data that nobody's seen before, or even that some have, um, seeing it and, under, and understanding it requires a certain amount of, you know, forgive me here for the poetic touch, but you, you, you must become one with that body of data. You need to soak that data up. You need to immerse yourself in it. And, and after a period of time, you will just get it. Uh, and I don't know any way to define that conveniently other than as, than, than as a form of an art. Um, Another thing that's important, I think, is that science is old and, and, and fundamental to human survival. It's, it's a trait that we have. So if a scientist is actually doing science, there's a great fulfillment when you suddenly come to a realization that you have a piece of knowledge, that you know something. There's a great deal of personal fulfillment that comes from that. And, and also the, the hope, the anticipation, that somehow that someday will be useful to somebody. The fact of the matter is, there's an awful lot of science. We have an awful lot of scientific knowledge. And no one scientist can even really understand a fraction of it. Um, and in, in order, therefore, to learn enough to do something that, 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 that is a contribution, you have to compartmentalize and specialize. You have to narrow your focus. Um, but in reality, to be effective um, beyond that little niche that you found for yourself. To be effective otherwise, in a broader sense, you, ha you have to at the same time not only be focused and knowledgeable in your area, but you also have to be, be, be very aware of the rest of science of the world around you. And um, the value of that, uh, and Einstein is a, is a wonderful case, but there are many others. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the, a physicist named Feynman when the, when the Challenger disaster occurred. Um, they had all the engineers and, and, and all the, the authorities were in it, and eventually Dr. Feynman took a piece of the, the space shuttle gasket, put it in a cup of ice water, and showed, showed them that it got rigid and, and would be inflexible, and that's why the shuttle went down. A very simple thing. But he had to fight as a scientist to get that very simple thing before a congressional committee and, and the people of the world. Um, but the point is that in times like those, the opinions of, of scientists are actually sought out. But there are other times. And I call it here a, a medieval reversion, or going back to ignorance is, ignorance is bliss. Um, as we move forward with technology, the, what, we go through these periods where we see catastrophe before us, we see, and, and wars are, are an easy example. And when we hit that point, we suddenly conclude that we, we need things that we don't know how to do. And we go to scientists to try to find the knowledge, and we go to engineers to try to develop the technologies. Um, but the, we then have these other times. And when we come out of that, that period of great stress, we have a tendency to say, you know, hey, things are pretty cool. We're all making a lot of money. We aren't getting, you know, there's not a lot of bad things going on. And, and nobody's coming over the hill with, with you know, thousands of tanks to, to render us asunder. And uh, so science tends to fade. And then in certain, when times, when it gets more severe, scientists even become 
a villain. Because when scientists see something ahead, because scientists' jobs, among many other things, is to look ahead. The job of science is to predict the future. The great value of science to humanity is to say, I've studied this, and from based on what's happened over time, I can come to the conclusion that when we look ahead, this is going to happen, and you need to do something about it now. And it doesn't make a difference whether you're talking about your car, a piece of machinery, or the climate. That's what science is supposed to do. But what we've run into, and this also is not new, this goes back in history, is when what scientists are finding, when what science is, is projecting based on what it, on its studies, is not in accord with the wishes or the profitability of, of current interests, um, the scientists themselves uh, become, the science and the scientists become the subject of, of scorn. And so the, um, what's happened in recent times is scientists are now, I won't even say foreseeing anymore. A lot of people accept that it's occurring. But scientists have been for some time projecting that global climate change is going to happen and we're going to cause it. And that that's primarily because of our really reckless abandon in terms of development of fossil fuels. And I'm not saying that in a judgmental sense. We didn't know. It was great. It was frolic. You know, everybody could... We could, we could expand economies as rapidly as we wanted. We could expand agriculture with fertilizer and fuel and do all these things. But the only reason, because we had unbridled access to fossil fuel, we found a way to do that. Um, now what we're finding out is that, hey, there are consequences to that. And that's one of the lessons of, of natural systems. There are consequences to everything. I've been sorely reprimanded a number of times by economists because I say, and my contention is the world is a zero-sum game. Um, and economists will say, oh, no, that's not true. And I say, wait a minute, stop. If you think of the world as an ecosystem, it's a zero-sum game. There's only so much in it. There's only so much calcium, so much carbon, so much oxygen. And it can only be put through so many forms so fast. And only a very small portion of those forms can we use. And the, 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 in the ecosystem of the world, it matters how much is there, and it matters how fast it's turning around. And you can't get past that. That makes it a zero-sum game. There's, not, there's only so much to be had. How are we going to divide? And so when we get through with that, where we come out of this fossil fuel situation, all these issues is, our situation now is we, recommend, we recognize what we've done. And recognizing what we've done, we've recognized that we need alternative, alternative energy sources. And we need a lot of them, and we need them quickly. It's the only way we're going to get out of this. And what's happened recently is high volume hydraulic fracturing has come on the scene. And with that, we've been able to get at what are called unconventional fossil fuels. That means oil and gas that we could not get to before. Shale gas is the issue of discussion today, a particular concern. And methane is the cleanest burning of all the fossil fuel uh, in terms of carbon emitted to the atmosphere if you only count the burning. And the shale gas deposits have been recognized around the world, and they are large, and they're now accessible because of fracking. And so, voila, our energy problem is solved. We can switch from oil and conventional gas to unconventional tar sands oil and shale gas. And lo and behold, if we go particularly with the shale gas, as has as, as, as already been mentioned, the argument is shale gas burns cleaner. Therefore, we can continue to burn fossil fuels, and this cleaner fuel is going to buy us time. So we have more time to develop alternative energy. There's a difficulty with that. And that difficulty is actually twofold, and I'm only really going to discuss one of them here, but I'll mention the other. The other is a bias against developing alternative energy. If you, if you continue to have cheap fossil fuel, you will continue to pay no attention to, to supposedly more expensive alternative energy. Um, but the other issue that we're really here to talk about right now is uh, global warming. And, and global warming is due to enhancement of the greenhouse effect. The enhancement of the greenhouse effect is due to increased emissions of greenhouse gases, and the main one is carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. But we also have a concern about methane. And so when we take that concern into account, how does shale gas look? Uh, is it actually a bridge to a clean energy future? Or is it a bridge that just takes us farther out over this abyss that we'll eventually fall off of? The Earth is, in fact, a greenhouse, the way it works. 
we live on it because it's a greenhouse. The atmosphere is the greenhouse and it keeps us warm and protects us. It shields us from solar radiation that we could not tolerate and it also keeps in enough heat so that we have stable temperature conditions in a range that we can live in. On the earth, the atmosphere is in essence the glass. It's what provides a shield from the outside and what keeps the warmth in. Two things have to happen for a greenhouse to be warm is you have to let light in and then you have to let heat out, but at a rate that balances with the light coming in. Solar radiation arrives on the Earth's, on the Earth's surface primarily as sunlight. But what happens is when it hits the atmosphere, part of it is reflected back. When it hits other surfaces below the atmosphere, more of it is reflected back. But what hits and gets absorbed warms that thing. And you've all felt that, like on a beach, being out in the sun. And then once that body has been warmed, it re-radiates that energy back off. But when it radiates back off, it's not light in the sense that we think of light. It's not visible light. It's, it's a form of light called infrared. And it goes, it heads back out away from the Earth. And the Earth, in order to maintain a comfortable temperature, needs to receive a certain amount of light from the sun. It needs to, a certain amount of it needs to be reflected. A certain amount needs to be absorbed. And then it needs to be lost. It needs to be re-radiated back out as infrared light at a rate that keeps all of those things in balance so that the Earth doesn't get too hot or too cold. So the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere is directly related to how much greenhouse gas is in the atmosphere. The more greenhouse gas is in the atmosphere, the thicker the glass in the greenhouse, the less heat gets back out. Gases that absorb, we call those gases infrared if they absorb infrared light. There are a lot of gases in the atmosphere that don't. There are many that do, but the primary ones are carbon dioxide and methane. The use of fossil fuels is the major source. Um, carbon dioxide receives a bulk of the blame for global warming, and much of the climate uh, warming impacts are, of all other greenhouse gases, are actually reported as carbon dioxide equivalents. This is carbon dioxide concentration for the last 600,000 years in the atmosphere. What you see there is a 600,000 year period of time. In 600,000 years, there was, give or take, there were about six peaks. Roughly 100, every 100,000 years, we get a peak. But what you'll also notice about that is the highest one of all of them was 300 ppm. But if you look over on the far right, just past the zero, you'll see that that's now gone up to almost 400. You see where the dark blue stops and we get a little bit of gray and then the gray stops and I'm talking on the far right. The end of that gray is just about the beginning of the industrial era, around 1850. And then the next step you see is just about 1850 to around the beginning of World War II. And the next step, that you can't, and you can't see it well here because it's so steep, it's going up so rapidly. But post-World War II, we, we've, since World War II, we had a phenomenal rate of increase. It's getting faster and faster. This is methane. And there are two important differences I want to show you right away. One is that methane is in parts per billion Carbon dioxide we measure in parts per million. Methane is a much rarer gas, but is a potent greenhouse gas. The other thing I want you to see is that the average level for 600,000 years was about 500 parts per billion. And we are rapidly now approaching 2,000. And I wanted to, I tried to convert that to something that would, might make sense for people. And what I did here, a 600,000 year average, if you take all the methane in the atmosphere from sea level to the top of the atmosphere, and you then take all the methane and bring it down to a single layer, so it's just one layer of pure methane, you know, over a 600,000 year average, that would have been just over a quarter of an inch thick. Now, it's about one inch thick. In the same time frame, if you take the CO2, and you take the average level and bring it down to pure CO2, a layer of pure CO2. Over that 600,000 year period, you would have had 3.9 feet of CO2 over your head. That would have been your, your warm, your greenhouse blanket. Now we're at 6.6 .6 feet. But then if you take the methane and convert it so that it's in CO2 terms, you get its greenhouse impact as CO2, instead of having 6.6 .6 feet, we now have 9.2 feet. So we've gone from an average period over 600,000 years of just under five feet of CO2 over our head to approaching twice that level. 
It's unprecedented. There is, we, have no, we have nothing like this since the time of the dinosaur. Methane is generally regarded as the little brother to CO2. The trick is that how you calculate CO2 is very important to that comparison. The other issue here that we have very little data on methane. As Barbara mentioned, estimates based on estimates. Can we use methane as a bridge to a clean energy future? We can increase production rapidly. There's opportunity for, there is there opportunity, there is opportunity for more effective regulation. But somebody has to decide it's important enough to do it. We also have, which is what Bob Ackley and I are working on, we have new measurement capabilities. We can measure methane now at extremely low levels, rapidly and reliably. In the past, the regulations and, and policies were based on estimates, not measurements. We can now make those measurements. When you base policy on no data, you're effectively guessing. And when you're guessing about something that, it, that we know is increasing at the rates that we looked at just a minute ago, those guesses could be disastrously bad. Um, so we, we did our Manhattan studies. Our first run was really a preliminary ground level survey of methane concentration in Manhattan to try to get an idea of how many leaks might be occurring in Manhattan. We collected a lot of data, we saw a lot of leaks, and we also saw the, for me it was a personal experience in observing what I call the crazy concrete canyon winds. Um, this represents a little bit of the data from the survey. The uh, peaks that you see there are, are all indicating elevated methane levels. Many of them indicate gas leaks. This is another view to contrast Manhattan with the area outside of the city. On the left side over here where you see all the peaks, that's Manhattan. When you drive away to the north and outside the city, you can see what happens to the methane levels over on the right side. That's normal background, something that would, that's what's happening in Manhattan. What we did, and frankly, largely because of a challenge from these three ladies sitting up here, was they said, well, you know, what can we do with the data? And, you know, can you say this? Can you say that? I, and I would, as a scientist, I kept saying, no, we can't say that. And, and I said, you know, we have, the only way we can say more than what we're saying, other than there's some leaks there, and a lot of them, we have to be able to convert that data about those leaks into something that tells us how much methane is actually coming up out of Manhattan and going into the atmosphere. And they challenged us to do it, and we did. And so... The result of that work was we found that our measurements indicated the amount of emissions of methane out of Manhattan are somewhere between two and ten times what industry and government are estimating that they are. Substantially more. And if you look back at those greenhouse gas graphs I showed you a minute ago, you know, what happens on the far right side of those graphs if the implications of those things are missed by somewhere between two and ten times? So underestimating, if you, if you were to run with those government's estimates, which they're doing currently, then you're going to severely underestimate the rate of climate change and the impact of greenhouse gases. The mixing layer is actually the boundary, of the, the called the planetary boundary layer. It's right at the surface of the Earth. And it's a very turbulent zone because of that. Anything that comes out at the surface gets mixed very rapidly through the mixing layer. Above the mixing layer, there is a horizontal laminar flow portion of the atmosphere where the winds flow smoothly and that constrains those gas movements, the turbulent gas movements, to below. And I wanted to show you just what some air turbulence looks like. Uh, this is a dust devil. You can see that's very f smooth country out there. There's no surface roughness. Here's another one. That's an airport hangar over there. Not a tornado. This is just a very temporary wind phenomenon. But what I wanted you to see these for is to understand the equivalent of this happened between the buildings in New York City and Manhattan all the time. Anytime there's a little wind blowing, and I, I don't know how many of you, I have had occasion to see what I call trash twisters. Um, you'd be walking down the street and all of a sudden a bunch of paper and stuff will just swirl up into the air and, and, and then move over and fall back down. This is a view of the mixing layer from somewhat above. This is Berlin at night. The uh, level of light, the area of lights you see below there, that's Berlin, the buildings in the city. That band of very light color with a very smooth top is the mixing layer that night over Berlin. And the dark band above it is the laminar flow air, that smoothly flowing air that the, that the mixing layer does not penetrate into. The pollutants, in our case, the methane, what we're concerned about, is stays in that layer below. If we know the height of that layer, and we know the concentration of the methane in it, and we know the local wind speed, we can calculate how much methane is moving. 
And that's what we did. I showed this because this is Krakow, Poland. This is the only city I've been able to find where anything like the study that we've done here in Manhattan with emissions was ever done before. And the reason I wanted to show it to you is to get some idea of the lay of the land and, and surface roughness, which is a big factor in, those, in the, the turbulence of the flow and the, and the mixing layer. And then this is the Manhattan skyline. You can't really see it very well here, but the point of this is it's a much rougher surface than Krakow, Poland and much more extreme because you have so much concrete, so many buildings, the heat island effect and the heating at different times of the day is, is much more extreme. So we then did our, our, our study that we've recently completed. What we did is we wanted to go up in the buildings and determine is the concentration of methane when we get up above the ground in Manhattan actually the same as it is on the ground. And our conclusion was that we went to 10 buildings, anywhere from 60 to 540 feet, we took our measurements, and we concluded that yes it is. And that then goes back and allows us to stay with our original estimate and say we do not need to modify that estimate. Our assumptions about the mixing layer were good. Our estimates should be good. We need to recognize that conditions are actually worse than what everybody is being told. There are a lot of projections of climate and, and government policies that are based on no data at all. They're just assumptions. They're estimates based on estimates. And I would like to see us get back to the point where we're willing to, to, to listen to scientists because, hey, scientists spend a lot of time, a lot of very lonely time, digging into things that the rest of the world doesn't have time to do and probably couldn't do because it takes years of, years of training to do it. Um, I'd like to see the society recognize that, hey, we need this done. It's the only way we're going to find a way out of this. I would also like to say that scientists are terrible communicators. Um, and which is where there's been a wonderful kind of relationship here with these artists because even this evening when I got over here, I was, I was telling Rebecca earlier, I wasn't sure how this was going to fit together for you folks, um, for me to do a talk like this and them to present their thing. And then I saw their work on the wall. I'd seen it before, you know, on emails and so forth, little images. But when I got aside and saw it on the wall and then saw it up here, it suddenly hit me, hey, they got it right. Um, <laughs> One of the things that also struck me in preparing this was I, I suddenly remembered the old bumper sticker that's been around for a long time, think globally, act locally. And it suddenly hit me, won't work. This is a global problem. You've got to think globally and you have to act globally. It's not sufficient for Joe and Bill to cut their gasoline consumption if the 100 million other people don't. You know, frankly, you make no difference at all. It is my opinion that there needs to be a massive assumption of responsibility. We've all benefited from this for a couple of generations. We're all sitting here. We have the accrued wealth that has come from this. It's time to recognize that we have not been paying the costs. And then finally on this list is studying and refining climate models. Those are very important to the government policies, international policies, and so forth. But if those climate models are based on no data or bad data, they're going to be wrong. And the policies and international decisions that come from them are not going to hit the mark. And we need to get there. These are just some suggestions, and I'm sure others will come up with others, of, of things that people might consider doing. But the main thing for you folks is, you know, become active in some way. Uh, artistically, uh, just communicate with your, with your elected officials, but become active. Recognize that, that this is out there, and it is... It is bad news. Um, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Bryce. Um, we'll now hear from Ruth Hardinger. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here, and I want to say that this is All Hallows' Eve. This is a really interesting day to be having this conversation because Hallows' Eve was the time when people would start to measure what happened at the end of the fall, at the end of the harvest season, and the beginning of the winter. And 
what's happening with climate change means that we are going to be losing some of this predictability. My intention is not to spook you, but our society needs to stop change, using climate change issues as if it were a trick or treat. In May this year, there was a Navy Admiral, his name is Samuel Locklear, and he's the commander of the U.S. Forces of the Pacific, and of 14 other top military leaders saying that climate change is the largest threat our nation faces. The head of the United Nations Committee on Climate Change recently said that global warming is absolutely linked to a spate of wildfires and heat waves, while calling on international leaders to address the matter with more urgency. In October, the Supreme Court allowed the Environmental Protection Agency the ability to regulate greenhouse gases as a pollutant, and that stands. Climate change is being acknowledged. What that acknowledgement intends to look at is an important question. Just real briefly, back to the methane question, the, the fact that methane has a much more potent green, is a much more potent greenhouse gas in the first 20 years of its presence is really important. And that is why we are so concerned about gas leaks. And, you know, carbon dioxide has this sort of 100 year deg degradation situation. But when we have all of the quantity of gas that's leaking out of the wells, out of the transmission lines, and out of the distribution lines, then we're looking at a lot of methane in a very immediate form. Um, we hear in the face of all of this that natural gas is this incredible boom and we are getting peppered with commercials all of the time about how fracked gas is this great fuel and is this great bridge to a future. It's the dagger in the throat of global warming. Well, we're seeing a different picture. Many of the industry claims about the minimal impact of fracking has been dissolving and we're looking at it in a closer way. We are looking with a whole lot more scrutiny and there's been an incredible activism going on in New York and also other parts of the country. Actually, Barbara didn't tell us this, but she was one of the, she was one of the first whistleblowers in the East Coast and Damascus Citizens was the first group to start this. Scrutiny is what's happening in New York, and our state has amazing activism. Becca and I are just picking up on it with our emissions project. This photograph that you see on the wall here is one of my very favorite of Mesoamerican sculptures. This is an ofrenda four. It's called an offering, and it was made by the Olmecs at about 600 BC. It's from the site of La Venta in Mexico. And I want you to just notice there are different colors of jade. Some of them have little spots, some of them are light gray, some of them are dark. There's this taller guy over in this, on the other side and he's made with probably limestone. But I think this is an incredible image. For me, we don't really know, by the way, archeologists don't really know what this was about, but I'm gonna tell you my take which is this is about a community, this is about sharing, this is about coming together, this is about a group of people who are going to be dealing with something together. And for me, this is what activism is really all about. It's about a community. And if we're going to address the issues of environment and climate change, we must join and we must participate together with scrutiny. Activism in New York is large, growing mostly as a grassroots-based informed opposition, which is what Damascus Citizens is, by the way. My experience is that the participants are inspiring and welcome and have deep purpose to protect their homes and the surrounding environment that generates and maintains life. There are over 100 groups, I don't know if you guys know this, there are over 100 groups working to oppose fracking in New York State. In fact, Woodstock's town board voted to petition New York State to make hydraulic fracturing a criminal offense. They did that last year. As of May 2013, I know, 300 towns upstate have either banned or placed moratoriums on fracking. 
48 of these are in the New York City or the Syracuse watershed. Um, what I just want to notice is that's only a two-year moratorium for, these, for the New York City watershed, by the way. In spite of enormous information about fracking dangers and the mysteriously hidden state health impact study that has left us in a limbo land, regardless, the state is now permitting infrastructure development. Compressor stations that, that seriously pollute air is in progress. Now there's a comment period regarding underground caverns under the Seneca Lake to be used to store liquid gas. Right now in Manhattan, the spectral pipeline, which has been built regardless of great opposition coming through on 14th Street going across the city here, goes into operation on November 1st. And in case you've not heard, this is the one that's designed to bring Marcellus gas to us. The gas with extremely high levels of radon, a known cancer, a known carcinogen. This is lung cancer. And unless a regulation is passed to require the city gate to hold the radon quantity of regional gas mixes down, we could have radon laced gas way above safe levels. Concern about impacts regarding gas use have expanded from environmental damage at extraction to bringing the gas to our homes and our lives. And we see this is accompanied yet with even more damage. In Manhattan, are we standing in a cloud of methane? Damascus citizens commissioned and collected studies from independent hydrologists to warn about naturally occurring volatile organic chemicals, frac fluids, and gas that migrate up to aquifers and in groundwater surfaces. This is always something that's been totally fascinating to me. The whole process of what migration is about. I mean, people say, yeah, well cases, they can be more safe, but you know, that is actually never going to happen because all well casings fail. They fail over maybe a really short period of time, maybe, maybe 10 years, maybe longer, maybe, but most hydrologists that Damascus Citizens has talked to and gotten studies by say this is going to happen within a century. Problem is, that methane is shale gas. That shale gas is the very same thing that's going to come to our city. This rampant methane is in the entire soup to nuts of the shale gas process. And what I want to point out is there are wells that have been tested in Colorado and in Utah, and we find that there can be as much as 17 parts per million of gas that's leaking. We don't know what's going on in the transition lines is what Bryce actually talked about for just a few minutes. It's not measured. This is really a problem. The gas companies and EPA relies on the gas companies and then they get this estimate of what they think. And they can, by the way, deduct 2% of the gas off their taxes so they often just say, oh well, the amount of leakage is 2%. So what's happening is a real big problem here. And we're trying to address that with this study. Again, this is, really, this is really amazing. I just found out this yesterday. The, you know, we talk about carbon dioxide, or about natural gas being much more clean. Well, it turns out that the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change says that if natural gas is burned until 2050, and by the way, this is one half the carbon of coal or oil, then it will raise the planet temperature six degrees. This is really no easy out. Our concern about addressing what causes climate change was to look further into the finger pointing of oil and gas. Our country has been in the dark because as Bryce and Barbara have both said, we're relying on estimates, not measurements. A large group of frack gas advocates are in a mental lockdown mode unable or unwilling to consider the possibility that success in facing global warming that they are trumpeting could turn into a disastrous example of the law of unintended consequences. This large group has been most reluctant to undertake the kinds of rigorous scrutiny these questions require. Accepting the burden of our advocacy, Becca and I decided that we, speaking for the people who have risen up to challenge fracking, had to try to get some answers about how much fugitive methane was being produced and develop some ways 
of communicating that finding that would break through the resistance of those who desperately wanted shale gas to be an energy and global warming success. Barbara Arendelle has been very much a part of this whole process. In fact, I have spent hours on the phone with her, with her explaining to me what was going on with this very dense, very thick report that Bryce has put together. This study has actually been under the auspices of Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, even though Becca and I have done a lot of the legwork here. This project actually started as a science investigation. We wanted data, we wanted facts, particularly looking into what was really happening in this city where we live. Bob and Bryce suggested that we do a five-day test of about 160 miles in the streets and avenues and paralleling the pipeline. So we were actually running along beside those. To me, this felt like Damascus citizens cast a net and got not just a fish, but perhaps the ocean. Our emission study was in progress about seven months before the application to MARFA came to attention. MARFA Dialogue's mission is to support the connections between art, activism, and science regarding climate change. When MARFA Dialogues awarded our sponsor, Cooper Union, this grant for our project, it was awesome because it is truly a perfect opportunity to communicate about our efforts. To be able to present this to you, our audience, is very special, and I'm totally grateful to the Rauschenberg Foundation, Marfa Bilerum, and the Public Concern Foundation. I also want to thank Kevin Bone, Saskia Boss, Barbara Arendelle, and Al Appleton for all the generous support that they have given us to connect out art, activism, and science. Well, this report was a real adventure. We jumped in the back of the car with Bob and Bob, Bob and Bryce, watching all these methane readings going on and watching basically what, was, what this whole process was about. Uh, Colleen has made some films of this effort, which is really pretty cool. Um, we actually got some press on it early in, the, um, early in 2013, after we finished the expanded report. So that was actually a really good thing. We got alternate, Common Dreams, EcoWatch, and even Bill McKidden mentioned it in one of his articles on the New York Review of Books. And then we ran this second test, which Bryce has also described, that mixing layer examination by calling up a whole bunch of our friends who lived in high buildings and asking us if we could get access to those. To have this opportunity now to mix art, activism, and science is really an extraordinary. And I want to say a few things about the art, um, even though I think the pictures really talk a thousand words. We asked three other artists to join us in exhibiting their work regarding the emissions. We brought diverse visual art about the heating up of the planet with gas, ranging from Colleen Fitzgibbon's documentation of the testing process and conversations between Al and Bryce about methane's potency regarding climate change to Joe Lewis's humor and satire of methane sensors on tennis shoes, to his seriousness of his image about how the earth would look with no ice. Christy Rupp's satire on the economic values and irony of collages with broken pipelines and flailing dollar bills, to Rebecca Smith's imagination of the complex atmosphere and how air waves are churning methane up into the mixing layer. A large image chart of the emissions created by Bob and Bryce are also included in this exhibition. My figure, or Stella-like group of envoys, messengers of methane, are likening the power of methane's potency to the weight of concrete. The IPCC just upgraded methane's potency from number 72 to 64. So this is like comparing one pound of methane to 84 pounds of carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. My use of concrete is about reaching out for a concrete presence. It's about my hope for the substantial and the factual to succeed. There's a rich history of art expressing social and political issues and environmental concerns in more literal forms. I'm thinking of Francisco Goya's paintings of the war. There were other artists in the 70s and, and 
like Robert Morris, Nancy Holt, and Robert Smithson that it created installations that were like earthen homages. But more recently, Merle Eucalys Latterman becoming an artist of residence at the Department of New York Sanitation, and Mary Misses City of the Living Lab, Betsy Damon remediating a garden in the Fu and Fan River in China. This is only to mention a very few of the substantial artists addressing environmental damage and climate issues. This is really an exciting time to reach out for art making that is taking on environmental issues and to express them in this treasured diversity. Our study of only 160 miles in Manhattan plus other fugitive emissions in US cities, and by the way, this is really important, New York is not alone here. This is happening in Boston, it's happening in Washington, DC. You guys have been doing studies in some of these other cities, and this is something that's going across the country. This should be so much information that it should encourage us to put a stop to this human-driven damage that is devastating our planet. We can address causes like the short greenhouse gases, meaning the gases that are more potent in the immediacy. Frankly, this is not a complicated conclusion. Any further development of gas is a waste of precious time and money to slow down the forthcoming events like more sandy hurricanes and Irene hurricanes, flooding out Boulder, Colorado, fires in Yosemite, change of insect and bird habitats upstate, mile-wide tornadoes in Oklahoma, and the tornado watches about a month ago here in New York. We don't get tornadoes. In 2011 and 2012, the disaster relief in the United States cost $62 billion. In 2013, it cost $68 billion. I hope this panel and this exhibition helps us heed the warnings and provide information that exposes how current policies tiptoe around these issues and how current practices around shale gas are exacerbating the problem. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Now we'll hear from Rebecca Smith. My tape drawing installation, Mixing Layer Atmosphere, is an on-site wall drawing created over three days in the Great Hall Gallery at the Cooper Union for Science and Art. I made the work in response to my participation in the Manhattan Methane Study that measured the fugitive methane emissions in the city I live in. These emissions come primarily from the aging infrastructure of the power company that, among other things, gives us heat and the ability to cook our food. This drawing is meant to convey the specificity and interconnectedness of certain facts. Global warming is a chemical process. It took millions of years for Earth's carbon cycle to get all that carbon underground. And we are now disemboweling the Earth and unleashing it into our ecosystem at a rate faster than the environment can process it. We are toxifying our habitat with carbon. In my drawing, an army of red dots. In this show, red is the color of methane because of the study images. That's a clue for how to see this show. Are rising from the earth and dispersing into the upper atmosphere. A couple of beefy, nasty looking oversized methane molecules hover higher up on the wall. On a visit to Australia in 2005, I became aware of how intense the sun was, more so than in the US, in researching the tape drawing I was making for a project in Sydney, I found website images of holes in the atmospheric ozone layer above the Antipodes. Increasing ultraviolet exposure so much that my friend's doctors routinely recommended twice yearly checks for skin cancer. These holes were made by the action of halocarbons circulating in the atmosphere from refrigerants, fertilizers, and the like. I constructed these hot spots in neon pink and blue tape. I had spent years fending off, thinking much about climate change, even though I knew about it and felt a certain amount of dread. It was a huge subject, much contested, and seemingly too big to do anything about. 
It seemed impossible for me to wrap my head around it. But when I witnessed for myself its evidence in another part of the world, it became too real for me to mentally set aside. Upon my return to the States, I read Elizabeth Colbert's Notes from a Catastrophe about the devastating effects of climate change on past lost civilizations and present communities alike. Then I began to live with this reality. I started to learn more and figure out ways that I could take small actions. Climate was the issue that trumped everything else in my mind, but I realized that fracking was the local climate issue in my neighborhood. Things speeded up in this regard when my longtime friend Ruth Hardinger invited me to work on a project with her to help make it possible for a scientist and an engineer to make a study of methane emissions in New York City. In late 2012, gas safety began its test in Manhattan. One day, I rode in the car with Bob Ackley and Bryce Payne as they were taking measurements with the Picaro instrument over city streets. Another day, Ruth, Bryce, and I went to the top of buildings to obtain data at higher elevations. Bryce pointed out the mixing layer, which starts at ground level and can be up to six miles high, the height of which varies considerably. Hot and cold air cycles back and forth, and gases and particulates mix in the wind. You actually experience the mixing layer as the bumpy part of a plane ascent, and then the laminar flow is when it gets smooth. That day in spring 2013, it could be seen as a brownish haze delineated by the flat bottoms of fluffy clouds. It averages about 30,000 feet, or the height of Mount Everest, and comprises roughly the lower half of the troposphere the first atmospheric layer, and the place where all our weather happens. 80% of the density of the entire atmosphere is in this layer that tops out at about 12 miles. The kind of blue wavy lines is my little mixing layer, and all those yellow pieces of tape next to the one red piece of tape is a visualization of how much of the equivalent of one piece of methane 84 pieces of carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is sort of like the, the, the value that's used to express um, these various gases. Th this value at 84 is set for 20 years. Other values, you see smaller values, they may be connected to 100 years. We don't have 100 years. As you have heard, the test shows that we live amidst a cloud of methane that is not only directly unhealthy for living organisms, but more importantly is a powerful driver of climate change. So-called natural gas is in fact methane energy, putting to use a fuel many times more powerful, a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. An odorless, colorless gas that is lighter than air and highly prone to leakage. What can an art show do about this? Giving art the burden of this message is a tall order. Yet art has always been part of its time in history. By drawing with tape on the wall directly, I tried to echo the immediacy of observing real phenomena. Handwriting the wall labels was an effort to make the hard information available to the viewer in a friendly way. The piece is straightforwardly didactic because we have a lot to learn about what we are doing to the planet. The two concepts central to understanding the significance of this study are the fragile balancing act that is the Earth's atmosphere and the rapacious rate at which fossil fuels are forcing that atmosphere to heat up. Thinking about the climate crisis brings two visual ideas to mind. The first is the story of equilibrium and its disruption. We have seen an 11,000 year era of climatic stability been replaced by runaway warming. The balance of gases is complex and delicate. We have forced it to warm to an extent that will continue for 20 or 30 years, even if we stopped all fossil fuels this minute. Even a little rise in temperature generates enormous change in weather, sea level, ice, freshwater supplies, agriculture, economics, and human misery. This is also a story about scale. Our breathable planet is a tiny place. Without the relatively thin layer of atmospheric greenhouse gases, our planet would be too cold. Like Mars with its very thin CO2 atmosphere, or too hot, like Venus, 
whose massive greenhouse effect has the surface hotter than the inside of your oven on broil. Bryce Payne has described the global environment as, quote, miraculous in that it is so complex and all of it is essential. It is crucial that we recognize and appreciate the complexity and detail of the physical world, that it is comprised of a myriad of intricate parts, and that to a great degree each part needs the other to exist. It is imperative that everyone understand how serious the crisis of climate change is. And by the way, it is a great feeling to do something in this fight. It's not your job to fix the world all by yourself, but everyone can do something because the forecasts from scientists are truly dire. We can take action, and we must. Thanks. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, everyone. I think this has been a very meaty presentation, and I think I'd like to get to questions from the audience as soon as possible. But I would like to give each member of the panel the opportunity to ask one question the other members of the panel. Why don't we start with you, Barbara? The actions of the gas industry and the supporters, which include a lot of uh, the geopolitical uh, entities, ignore both the health impacts, uh, immediate health impacts of the uh, gas drilling that's going on, and also the, the um, potential, as it's called, um, impacts, which include sea level rise, and um, acidification of the ocean, uh, which means the food supply will collapse. So we really have to get on this like right away. Uh, the geological leakage in the fields, in the gas fields, is uh, very considerable. It's been measured by USGS at four to eight percent. So I would ask the other members of the panel, what should we do? Can you get to ask one? <laughs> Well, let's see if Al has an answer. Well, I, let's have the artist's view of this first. Ruth? <laughs> I would say pull the plug. <laughs> right, Becca? Well, I start the transition immediately to sustainable energy. Price? Um, I'm, of course, a scientist. I see it might be much more complicated. But, um, I said, as a scientist, I of course see it as a much more complicated thing. Um, say again, I didn't hear that. Said. Um, my position is we must stop this, but we cannot. I'm sorry? Explain that? No, go ahead. Uh, we'll take that when we get to okay. questions. <laughs> All right, I guess. Can I add something more? Yes, please, Ruth. Samara Swanston um, is the attorney for the New York City Council Environmental Committee, and she has put together a list of the bills that New York City has actually um, developed and passed, and they're out on the Damascus Citizens website table out there, and it talks about renewable energy and solar and some of these things. And, you know, when I said quickly pull the plug, I kind of, you know, I know it's radical and it's impossible to do that overnight. Um, but I do think that we need to, as Becca has said, get on to renewable energies as soon as we possibly can. And we need to figure out methods to do that. And actually, I'm hoping, Al, that you might talk more about that. Um, well, I thought I would say a few things about summing up, but I think in terms of Bryce's comment, I do want to respond. Um, one of my favorite Mencken quotes is that to every complicated problem, there's a simple answer that's wrong. Um, on the other hand, I also believe that to every complicated choice, there's a simple answer that's usually right. And that clarity of purpose you know, can get bogged down if you confuse means and ends. Means are always complicated, but ends have a certain simple elegance that I hope our artists will help us capture. I agree with uh, Ruth. At the end, we're going to have to pull the plug and we should get on with it. And that's going to mean an awful lot of complicated things. But, you know, it's kind of like canoeing a river. Um, rivers have currents, rivers have rocks, rivers have eddies, rivers have shafts, chutes. Um, but you got to go with the flow. And 
you got to make every choice on the basis of does this make it make the flow work for me, and that's how I do it. Um, okay, Becca, you have a question. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I, I want to get to the audience. Right there. No, I, I actually. I, uh, I just had a question about the mixing layer, um, and and uh, how um, how why is it important to understand the mixing layer to understand what me happens with methane. Are you asking me? Yeah. Yes. Who else knows about the mixing yeah. layer here? Everyone put up their hand. No, 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 I, because on these microphones, my ears aren't what they used to be, and I, I hear a lot of ringing, and I don't hear, understand everything you're saying. Anyway, so you're asking me about the mixing layer. Why is it important? Yes. Um, it was because you and Ruth and, Be and Barbara challenged us to take leak data, which is just point by point how much methane there is at points on the ground, and convert that into a, an emissions estimate for the whole area where all those points were located. Um, in order to do that, we have to have a place, a surface, if you will, and we have to know how fast air is moving to that. So if we know this whole surface here, we know the size of this surface, this vertical wall. And we know air is moving through that at, say, eight feet per second. Then in one second, I know how much air moved past that wall. If I then know the concentration, average concentration, of all the air that went through that wall, I now have how much methane went through that wall. And the difficulty is that how tall is that wall? How long the wall is easy. We can drive that length and measure it. But how tall is the, is the volume of air where the concentration on average through that whole height is the same as it is on the ground where we collected the data? And quite, I mean, I, the, my, your, your challenge was my introduction to the mixing layer. Um, and as I went through the literature and tried to identify a way to do this, went through the scientific literature and, and found particularly that Krakow Poland study and a couple of others, and I then looked at the Manhattan situation, I thought, you know, that should be it. Because we take, because of the instrumentation that we have, we can collect so much data so fast that we can get a, a, a methane, an average methane number that just couldn't be done in the past. And with that kind of density of, of data, we can get an average number, but we've got to know how high that number goes. And in the end of all this, um, we actually, and I, sh I should give credit here, the uh, City College of New York has a facility called the, the Optical Remote Sensing Laboratory, where they run an instrument called a sealometer, which basically shoots laser beams up in the sky, and they have a special thing on it to make sure there are no planes overhead when they shoot them up. Um, <laughs> and and it shoots a laser beam up, and then all of the trash in the air reflects a little bit back. And at that point, it's like a sonar unit or radar. It's actually like radar. The, a computer then generates an image. And you can go to their website and see these images. They're actually quite interesting. But that allowed us to get a, a quantitative numerical estimate of how high the mixing layer was on the days that we were driving and collecting that data. And if we hadn't had, if we hadn't found that that work had already been done, particularly in Poland, and hadn't found that data on the, on the City College of New York in, uh, website, we wouldn't have been able to generate that estimate. But, the, but that's the importance of the mixing layer. It, it controls where the methane is, what the concentration of it is, and if you guys are having a bad air day, it's usually because the mixing layer is, is thin that day and all that stuff is being held down here at ground level. Um, the, the other part of it is that the measurements were taken at street level. And um, um, the idea that uh, to convert that to a volume, uh, you have to make sure that that's really a volume and, if it's a, and that it's a viable method of interpreting your street level data as a block of material. Um, that can be looked at um, as incoming, picking up methane, outgoing. And having, having a, the whole thing having a, a same average 
Now, there's an average here and an average here are different. So what's in between is the difference. Right. So we went there. back and looked at the mixing layer. Is it real? Is it, is it actually mixed? And while um, um, Bob was running around in a car on the street, Bryce, as tall and thin as he is, was in the subway with a backpack on him with a schnoz sticking out, looking like um, Ghostbusters and uh, going from building to building. <laughs> there were a few questions, but surprisingly few. This is New York. <laughs> I think one of the things, I'm gonna open, the, I'm gonna open this now to audience questions, but I think one of the things I would like to, everyone to take away from here is to realize that this is science in the old-fashioned sense. You know, you ask a question, you figure out what you've got to do to answer it, and you do it. And the reason I want to stress this is because there's an awful lot of pseudoscience in the fracking debate. And there's an awful lot of people who try and manipulate science in the fracking debate. Um, and by those people, not to me too, too obvious about it, I mean the industry. Um, I, I get some ridiculous statements from the industry. For example, they love to say that fracking fluid is only one two hundredth of a chemical compound. So how can anything that's only one two hundredth of a chemical compound be unsafe? Well, the answer is, if you look at any of these chemical compounds, they have toxicities expressed in parts per million. So if something at five parts per million is poison, if it's five parts per two hundred, that liquid is incredibly poisonous. Um, so we're con the People have made air studies and they have been attacked, viciously attacked, by industry minions who are claiming that, you know, they, they didn't do the science right. Um, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. These are all kinds of pseudo questions that are brought up. And I'm certain as these numbers get into the public debate, um, everyone at this table, with the possible exception of myself, because I, I don't have as many fingerprints on them, uh, is going to be similarly attacked. Um, the, many of the people in the anti-fracking debate are attacked as emotional. Somehow to be emotional is not to be scientific. I mean, emotions are about values. Value, science is actually about values if you read Einstein and other places. Um, but it's very important for you as an audience to understand that this is about your future and it's basically based on two kinds of truth. It's based on science truth and it's based on the truth of art. These are two different ways of searching for truth in the world, and both of them come up with the same answer. All right, um, and I'll talk a little more about that at the end. Ruth, quickly. Can I just ask a quick question? Um, or maybe make a comment with a question attached. The Less preferred, but go ahead with the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we did the study, I remember in the preliminary report talking about the amount of gas that you measured once you got outside of Manhattan was like 1.8 parts per million or whatever, which is pretty much a baseline. I mean, that's kind of like organically what you would be getting from grass and trees and whatever stuff. Um, when you get to Manhattan, it's raised a whole lot more, like, you know, a third more, a fourth more. These numbers are really important. And what the study has found is that we have about 5% leakage here in Manhattan. And that's a really high number for, you know, what this is. This does not mean like explosion levels or whatever, but it's a, it's a number that's really significant in terms of what climate change is about. And it also is really significant in terms of how much um, greenhouse gas is coming from gas and oil or oil and coal. And ultimately what we're finding in this study is that oil and coal are actually not nearly as full of a greenhouse gas as gas is. And I think it's, now we've got to make a question out of this. Um, Indeed you do. <laughs> how do we deal with it? <laughs> how do we explain this? And but you, you, what you're really talking about is net greenhouse effect compared to, you know, a compartmentalized greenhouse effect. So if yeah, the recent report came out, I think it was Energy Information Agency, I think, administration, I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They recently came out that uh, this year, I believe it was, 2013 or 2012, had lower 
CO2 emissions than the year before. Um, it was EIA. It was since 1994. And, and so the difficulty is that, and they built into that assumption. They said, you know, it's probably because we're burning more natural gas instead of coal. The problem is that they restricted the statement. You have, to under, you have to listen to the statement very carefully. They said carbon dioxide emissions. They didn't say greenhouse gas emissions. So they only counted carbon dioxide. But the carbon dioxide went down because they're burning more gas than they were coal. Well, no, because they're burning gas instead of coal. So if you, if you then take the gas that was escaping in the process of using that gas, of burning it instead of coal, and take that into account, it's very unlikely, I mean, if we had real numbers in terms of real data, it would be unlikely that that statement would remain true. Uh, okay. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit. Okay. Questions, please? Um, I've got a bunch of fan. Should I talk into the sure, mic? Please. Yeah. Um, regarding the, uh, the mixing layer, now that um, New York City, as of, as of Friday, actually, is going to be getting uh, a portion of its gas from the Marcellus Shale, which has a high uranium and, ra and radium content. And it's been established that radon will be carried in the fracked gas. Does that mean that once all of these buildings that burn gas are, start receiving this, um, you know, Marcellus methane, given all of these leaks, does that mean that we're going to be have, it's going to be completely infused with uh, radon, this, this huge mixing layer, and the, the entire city will be suffused with elements of radon? I've got to be very careful how I answer this. Um, uh, the simple answer to your question, which of course Al and I frequently have this discussion, sometimes the simple answer isn't where you should stop. The simple answer to your question is yes. The the more, shall we say, the subtleties of the answer to the question are a um, question of dilution. Uh, and, um, a very low concentration of radon is, is it, no amount of radiation. Radon is, is, has just because it's radioactive in essence, you're going to get radio, radiation exposure because of it. Um, and no amount of radiation is safe. Um, you should al it's always better to not be exposed to it than to be exposed to it. But at, when you reach a certain point of dilution, so the concentration is, is very low, your exposure is, nobody can calculate the, you know, the incremental increase in, in risk to you. The difficulty in that case, I don't think is so much the issue of the mixing layer, where everybody's gonna get this averaged out exposure. The difference is, let's say somebody's in an area where the air circulation in that particular location is kind of closed off. You know, it's, it spins around in there for a while, between in a certain building complex or something like that. And this, this particular building complex has furnaces burning gas. In that area, in that zone, you're going to get, have higher radon levels than you will on average in the, in the rest of the, in the, of the mixing layer. So folks that are in there, are, you know, can, there's a possibility we're talking about an elevated risk for people there. People who are going to be more at risk are going to be gas workers, people who work in the vicinity of, of um, furnaces and so forth and so on, they're going to be at risk. There's going to be an increased risk for them. Or what about if you're cooking every, not every day? Yeah. Apartments where you have gas coming in, you cook with it, you know, and, and so forth. That, that gas is just going into your, into your apartment statement. Yeah. Okay. Next, Thank please. you. Into the air in your apartment that you breathe. Yeah, I was wondering if all of you on the panel, are you aware that they're requiring here in New York for the buildings to convert in two years from oil to gas? And um, it's not a choice. All the buildings have to do that. So for me, I see that as ominous because I believe then that the politicians see this as a done deal. That, you know, because, you know, why would the buildings be converting from uh, oil to gas, um, and they recently built a filtration plant up in the Bronx, and I'm still wondering why. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is any chance, all the fracking groups I think you're doing a great job, but is there any chance of incorporating into your groups a, an educational component 
where you knock on people's doors and tell them what fracking is because I can't tell you how many conversations I have with my neighbors, whether they're here in New York in the Bronx or upstate New York, and they say to me, what is fracking? And when I start telling them what fracking is, they look at me like I'm crazy because they can't believe that anybody would harm their water supply. And, you know, yes, yeah, some of these people like upstate New York watch Fox News all the time, et cetera, et cetera. They're very Republican. But when it comes down to giving their children clean water and clean air, really in the end, that doesn't matter. So I think from my perspective, there's an educational component missing to get to the bigger masses because I, I would expect this room to be packed. Well, I, I, like I said, I try to explain to people and they look at me like I'm nuts because obviously I'm not telling them the right things. So I, then maybe I need to be educated more. I would be happy to do, but I need well, to be educated sign more. Up, sign up <laughs> down there, put your name on the DCS sign up sheet, and um, we'll give you as much literature as you can use and, and report on your progress. I think that's marvelous. Well, okay. I think uh, part of the problem, of course, is in an issue like this, um, Everybody always struggles with the question of how to get in front of the public. And forums like this are a way of developing information material. And the truth of the matter is, is you know, if anyone had a magic formula, they'd make a lot of money. Um, the best we can do is the work of people like Barb in distributing materials and creating websites and having links. Um, in, and having informed people like yourself who have the patience to put up with stupid questions about what is fracking. Because um, that is very, very important. Let me say something about the radon. It's not a forced conversion to gas. It's a forced elimination of oil. Now, part of the, pr part of the problem, I mean, you could conceivably go to green energy as a replacement for the oil. Part of the problem here is Mayor Bloomberg is very gung-ho about public health. He's really not an environmentalist, but he's a public health guy. And the data is very clear that the oil burning furnaces do create a lot of respiratory problems. They're linked to high asthma rates in people. So that before people understood all of this about radon, um, converting to natural gas seemed to be a great idea. Particularly if like Bloomberg, once you've saved the watershed, you're not really tuned into the problems other people upstate have with fracking. So, you know, everybody's kind of made this commitment to natural gas because they see it, you know, being a good public health measure because, you know, there are other environmental issues besides global warming, burning fossil fuels. So what we're, so we're kind of swimming upstream, you know, we kind of stumbled onto the radon stuff. I mean, partially, you know, I'll take a little credit for it. Partially it's a bunch of people saying, you know, if we're going to jump with this, you know, you know, a lot of people were kind of sitting around basically and having conversations, common sense conversations like you would have basically saying, if all of this wastewater is so radioactivity that comes out of these fracking wells, what's happening to the gas? What's the, what's the radioactivity level in the gas? Once you begin to ask that question, you begin to follow it down some kind of dark pass, as they'd say on HBO, you know, in the... And what we've been trying to do in the last year, and we're going to go back up the mountain soon with the help of people like Dick Gottfried and Linda Rosenthal in the State Assembly, is get the goddamn state regulators, pardon my French, but I don't understand as a former public health manager why if somebody comes and says, yeah, I got all this information on radon, you're not just running around saying, let's find out what the real story is here. Now, as I was going to say in my summary comments, um, the... Basically, you got an awful lot of people who've got a commitment to natural gas. Um, they think it's an answer to global warming. They want an answer to global warming. They like natural gas because they don't have to take on the fossil fuel directly. You don't have to say, as Ruth said, pull the plug. Um, you don't have to say, as I like to say, the era of fossil fuel is over. Fossil fuel is a $1 trillion industry worldwide. Um, these folks are not going to, they're going to have to be carried out. Um, and <laughs> The, and it's not just a question of public education, it's a question of organizing and finding the right push points and getting the right facts like we're doing here on methane and knocking down a lot of myths. Um, so all we can do is continue to have the help of you know, right-minded people like yourselves and we'll do our best. Uh, but that's some of the context for you to know. Ma'am? Yes, hi. Um, 
I've uh, just been thinking about what I can do, and um, you know, I don't just because my landlady is going to convert to a different boiler, I don't have to use that gas. So I'm planning on shutting off my gas, November 1st, and um, switching to electricity. I understand that there's a couple of um, uh, companies. Uh, one is called Pair. The other one is EE or something like that, where y they get. Um, 100% of the electricity um, from wind and solar. That's true. So that's what I, I want to do. I want to encourage other people to do that. Good. Thanks. I think that's a great idea, but I want to go back to the point about the radon and stumbling on this. We've been stumbling on this for a year and a half now, and I think one of the problems in your very cautious answer, the scientist here, is that is the problem, the very cautious answer, and the lack of information. The fact that we are still in the very baby stages of information, and that we have asked for public hearings so that the people in those buildings could be informed. I was struck by the picture you have of Manhattan, where you see the greater concentration on the Upper West Side, the Lower East Side. You see these tremendous concentrations of that uh, whether it's the mixing layer, I'm not sure I really understand it, but the methane coming out of those old buildings where the high rates of asthma are, or the concentration on the Lower East Side. We may very well be exchanging concentrations of asthma for concentrations of lung cancer in non-smokers. That's, That's what we're good. talking That's a, about. That's a nice fact. That's a nice, yeah. nice trade. So I really, I've stood behind this microphone at various town hall meetings, community board meetings, and I'm proud to say that CB7 has passed a resolution in their full uh, board meeting on this issue of public hearings. And I urge you to take it up. We really need to have them. These people need to be informed about what is happening. Well, you know, Chris Quinn, uh, partially because she was looking for support from Cuomo, quashed our request for a public hearing. Um, well, justice has been served, and justice has triumphed in that instance. I don't mind gloating a little bit. Um, it'll be very important for CB7 and other like-minded people to push the new consul, because we're going to go back, we're going to take this up the you know, up the mountain again with new consul the first of the year, and to push their councilmen to support exactly that public hearing. So that'd be a big help to us. Hi, my name is Andy Lawrence. I'm president of Lawrence Gold Advisors, based at the Empire State Building, and I called out before, and I apologize. You, uh, your answer was <laughs> quite succinct, but I want to just give a 30-second in road here. About a year ago. Dr. Appleton, you were at the Ethical Culture Society. You said three things. Uh, but this is about fracking, and I want to direct it uh, at Barbara. You said that reasonable, reasonable people can sit down with an industry and come up with reasonable uh, regulations on uh, that industry. Second, oil, you can do that with the oil industry. They just, they're just not going to listen to you. They're going to do what they want. The exceptionalism there has been manifest for decades. The third thing is you said that um, you went up to Cooperstown, and people that you spoke to in Cooperstown uh, you used the word civil war, how they were going to defend their rights. I went two weeks after that meeting to a meeting at uh, uh, Cary Institute up in uh, the other side Milbrook, of the river. Up, right, yeah, yeah. yeah, good spot. And there was a woman from RPI who made a presentation, and at the end of her presentation, she said after meeting with people down around Binghamton that there was, they would defend their rights and their property by civil war. And I went up to her, asked her, I said, with guns and stuff? He said, yeah, she went door to door in Binghamton. And there was a seriousness what these people were going to do to defend themselves. So here's the question, I guess. Uh, you know, science, after a while, takes a back seat when you know, folks really see their way of life being threatened. And I wonder if you see that up there, Barbara. And you know, you're obviously on the ground closer to it. I'm not trying to instigate anything. I'm just looking for feedback and stuff that I was well, really surprised in, to hear. In Damascus Township, uh, which is a pretty large area, it's 80 square miles. We did a rigorous baseline, uh, gas safety did it, of uh, the methane um, in, in the area. And um, uh, this past uh, summer, uh, the gas companies that had leased in the area withdrew. 
because yeah. they knew that if they if they came in there and they did damage, we would know exactly what happened. We essentially removed the exemption from liability that they had there. So my response is that you can take very positive action by establishing rigorous baselines, either methane baselines, water baselines, air baselines, health baselines, so that you are, as a population, removing the exemptions. You know what, we, what you have. And that is a very proactive move. Thank and you. it also works. Well, I think, you, I think your emphasis on way of life is important. We've got time for one more question. Because that's, I think, I don't think the people who are pro-fracking get the fact that that's what's really motivating people to fight it so hard. Sir. Hi, I'm, I'm not sure what I have as a question, but I wanted to uh, continue the conversation about the difficulty of getting the information about this in an un understandable way to the general public. I'm a science teacher in a public alternative high school here in Manhattan where we're not teaching to the test. In other words, I've been working, been able, I've had the freedom to work on a curriculum, a year-long curriculum based on earth, air, fire, and water. And I've, I come from an environmentalist background. And this year, they've instituted project-based learning in my school, which inspired me to come up with an idea for public education. And this is the advocacy part I'd like to invite you to join in. I took the curriculum that I had developed and put it in the framework of what I call a citizen's science toolkit. In other words, asking, the, you know, looking at science education, not from the point of view of, of giving students the foundations to become working scientists down the line, which is the academic way of teaching science, but to say that all students, very small percentage of students will become working scientists, but all students will become citizens. And so there needs to be a devotion of some time in science education towards readying citizens with the scientific knowledge they need to be knowledgeable and participatory in the regulation of science and technology. In other words, to understand the science that, they, that is needed to be understood in order to interact with public policies around technology. And so the, I just want to offer this as a thought and, of, and also an object of activity or, or uh, advocation that instead of having four years of academic science in high school, one year should be devoted to citizen science. In other words, looking, specifically looking at issues of public policy and global ecology and taking that, and taking that seriously as a necessary thing for citizens to know about and then giving students the uh, opportunity to learn enough science to undertake a responsible position on these policy questions. I think that's a very interesting the, idea. The Citizen right, Science you, Toolkit, so. If you leave your name out there and that you're a teacher and that you're working on that, we have had a whole series of teachers look at our poster, the What's in the Water poster, and they are teaching from that. And maybe we can connect a whole lot of teachers to work on this. If you would, as, if you would I just want to note that as long as teachers are, are teaching within the uh, manacle of the academic instruction of science in the spirit of producing future scientists, they are excluded. The textbooks, if, I, if you look at an advanced placement uh, environmental science textbook, you will find a tiny number of pages devoted to the science that is specifically oriented towards global ecological issues. It's phenomenal. Well, a lot of, a lot of the people who have come into our little office in Narrowsburg, New York, um, and look at like the what's in the water poster and they say, I'm a teacher, I'm gonna use this to teach from. A lot of them teach in private schools and your kind of school. So please leave your name and we can connect you with other teachers and maybe you know something really marvelous could come out of your collaboration. Something needs to happen at the level of the state education department. Well, yeah, but first you have to get something to say, hey, let's do it like this. Basically, ladies and gentlemen, it comes down to this. We had a wonderful ride as a culture with fossil fuel. 
but it's over. Um, the costs of using fossil fuel have not exceeded the 250 years of benefits we get from them. And where this rubber particularly meets the road is in the attempt of the fossil fuel industry to re-legitimize itself through the wonders of natural gas. Basically, there's three components they said earlier. When you take it out of the well, when you transmit it to the place, when you distribute it, if you lose more than 3% of all the gas in that process, you're going to be contributing to global warming. You're not going to be helping solve it. Now, the industry itself has a factor of loss of 6%, 2% in each of these segments. Um, the work Bryce has done and Mr. Ackley suggests we're actually looking something more like 10 to, we could be losing 10% of all the natural gas we take out of the earth um, to the atmosphere. If so, we are magnifying, not cutting down global warming. It's interesting to note that where the pre-industrial level of CO2 has gone up 40%, that is from 280 to 400 parts per million, the pre-industrial level of methane has almost doubled. So that methane is becoming a more important greenhouse gas. The, inter the International Panel on Climate Control recently said that the fastest and best thing we should do is control three precursors of global warming. These are black carbon, HFCs, the things that also eat the ozone layer, and methane. So that we are at a, at a point when we are being told by the best scientists in the world that we should cut down as methane as quickly as possible. We're actually encouraging practices that is are increasing fugitive methane. This is the definition of stupidity. Um, it is also a definition for the environmental groups that have been unable to kind of unwrap themselves from their advocacy of natural gas as a, as a tool with which to beat coal the ultimate environmental sin. For the ultimate environmental sin is to, to do something without thinking through all of its consequences. When I was putting together the watershed program for the Department of Environmental Protection, on which some whatever meager fame I have somewhat rests, um, one of the things we did is we hired over 200 people to set up over 10,000 water monitoring stations from the watershed to the bottom of the city. Um, so we had the data to know this. What Bryce said about we have estimates based on estimates is insane. It's also not necessary. The cost of doing this monitoring is trivial in comparison to the trillion dollar income that the fossil fuel gets. But, you know, what did one, what an old girlfriend asked me, tell me once, ask me no, ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies, um, or ask me no secrets, and I, you know, if you don't want to know them. This is the industry's approach to facts. They do not want the facts about gas fracking out on the table, because it doesn't add up. It's bad for them, it is very bad math. They depend on the image that for all, the in, for all the health impacts, for all the damage they're inflicting on the countryside, they're doing something good for humanity. They're helping control global warming. It is very clear from the data you heard tonight and from the other analyses that support it that whatever else you may think of gas fracking, the idea of promoting a natural gas industry based on gas fracking is a very dumb idea. We should go right away to green energy. Now, we know how to do green energy. There are going to be some teething problems. The Germans have jumped into this with both feet and have run into some of those. But the point is we can do it. The point is there's nothing technical about wind power, solar power, geothermal power that is an obstacle to converting us to a post-fossil fuel era. Smart cultures bet on the future. They do not bet on the past. The, I, it is easy to understand why the fossil fuel industry is clinging to the trillion dollars in income it gets every year. It's easy to understand why we human beings who are basically change adverse, we like to get into a rhythm and be comfortable, are having trouble getting out of this fossil fuel groove, but it's gotta go. 
And though it'll be a complicated problem, as Bryce warns it, it's a simple choice, as Ruth and Becca said. And it's, we should make it. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope this can help us. What does artistic inspiration, artistic process have to do with fighting gas drilling or climate change? The form someone's art takes is very personal. The most basic art form is how you live your life. Science, when well done, is actually an art. It is, it is largely a creative act. This should be so much information that it should encourage us to put a stop to this human-driven damage that is devastating our planet. This is really an exciting time to reach out for art making that is taking on environmental issues and to express them in this treasured diversity.